a software engineer at SoftServe. And today I wanted to walk you through the story of our performance issue investigation. And I would like to unite it in some kind of a roadmap for those who may encounter the similar issue. Uh, I will give you a bit of context. So we work with the video streaming and we have a data pipeline that collects events from the player. Uh, it's kind of heartbeat events and we aggregate them uh, by sessions in a one minute uh, time window. And based on this, we do some kind of metrics like uh, the number of simultaneous user, uh, the number of errors per time window. So basically to know how well performs your video streaming. And we use a data for, flow for processing and we use pops up as an input. And during the prime time, we have a bunch of analysts who keep a close eye on those metrics. So basically we have a near, near real time analysis and any delays like 10, 15 minutes plus is the real issue there. And we don't have some kind of huge load. Basically we have 40K events per second at the, at the peak. And turns out this isn't really a common challenge. And we had an issue with this. What you can see here is spike in data freshness. And it basically says that your data is late. And we will talk about it a bit later. And we had a multiple uh, spikes during the prime time. So we decided to do an investigation to find some kind of resolution. So we collected a bunch of leads that can help you to approach uh, similar issues from the different anglers. And what you can do is you can tune your job configuration, do code base analysis, Dive, uh, dive into data flow metrics, check event time source, dive into pop sub metrics to do performance testing, and there is a bit of mystery in the end. So, and the most easy things to do is to tune your job configuration. There is a bunch of obvious things to do, like to update BIM version to include like latest fixes, latest feature. You can use streaming engine. It moves pipeline execution out of worker virtual machines into the data flow service backend. You can see that there is special flag enable streaming engine here. And also in addition, it uses streaming pool subscription. Uh, also, you can check if you're using data flow runner v2. Runner v2 has sufficient portable worker architecture packaged together with the shuffle service and the streaming engine. And you can see that there is a special flag to use Runner v2 as well. And of course, auto scaling is great. It's a great feature that helps you a lot. Uh, but we need to remember that we will have data freshness spikes uh, during the scaling because it needs to redistribute the messages. So what can we do if we wanted to eliminate those spikes? Uh, you can configure the minimum number of workers to prevent your uh, pipeline to downscale less than you want it and to make sure that you always have sufficient number of workers to manage uh, predicted scale. You can see the flag for it to enable it. Also, what we did, you can experiment with the sizes of the virtual machines we took vcpu uh, number as the base and we tried different sizes we tried a uh, bigger number of smaller machines and vice versa and turns out bigger machines performed slightly better probably because of the less inter-worker communication uh, but what we did we did a press scaling so we created a job that uh, right before the prime time, it disables all the scaling and sets the fixed number of workers. And after the prime time, it uh, reverses those changes. Data flow allows you to do those changes on the flight so, do, so you don't have any downtime. And we also intentionally configured the redundant number of workers to make sure that we always have sufficient uh, computing resources and we don't have uh, any downscaling. So in the end, uh, after all of this, we got slightly smaller lag, uh, but in general, the issue persisted. So we went further. 
And when you looking for tips to help your uh, pipeline poor performance, the first thing you find and the most popular one that you need to replace the group by with the combine. But actually it isn't as simple as this. So let's recall for a moment, uh, for a moment what is the difference in a nutshell. So basically group by collects uh, all the elements together and process them together. And naturally what comes from it is the concern that you may have a, a data skew. On the other hand, there is a combine that uh, creates a bunch of partial states and uh, process them in parallel. And you need to keep in mind that you need to write code so to man manage uh, merge of those states. But another important thing is what you need to do is to consider your data distribution. Because if you have nearly equal uh, equally distributed data, your group by will perform just fine. And in addition, if your data is sparse, you will have an increase in a network exchange uh, because you will have a lot of partial states for because you have a lot of keys. So uh, we had a heartbeat event that aggregated the session. So we knew that uh, our events are nearly equally distributed. So it wasn't the case for us. Uh, but our advice here, just not to make a blind choice and consider your distribution before you do any crucial changes. So if it's not a data skew, uh, we decided uh, to check what we could do else and just to look for some slow parts of user code. And what you can do here, you can do profiling. You also wanted to keep a close eye on the CPU and memory utilization because it and the higher utilization may be the indicator that you have like some uh, kind of uh, these um, issues. You see that there is a special flag to enable profiler. And I know that there is a special heap profile available, but we didn't have a chance to use it. So you can see uh, the prof typical profiling on the slide. And it looks like a call stack where lengths represent an execution time. And at the first glance, it's really hard to find something there, but mostly we're interested in user code, in user code. So you can look for particular frames. Uh, in the case of part of function, you need to look for a frame that have that has invoke prefix element suffix and all the user code will be down the stack. So for instance, you may have some kind of uh, long API call or, or something, you know, uh, intensive computation. In our case, it was part of some function and it wasn't something significant. And basically we predicted it because we, we knew that our CPU doesn't go higher than 20% top. So we excluded the data skew, we excluded some slow parts of code. Uh, what could it be? We, we saw that code may be not the bad guy here. And we shifted our focus to the data flow metrics and the main metrics here is data freshness, and it's really crucial to understand what it means. So I'll stop here for a minute to realign on the main terms. And uh, we have an event time, and this is the time associated with the event that identified the moment of its occurrence. So basically, if we're talking about some kind of front-end application and the click event there, it would be the moment of actual user click on a button or whatever. So all the following metrics uh, rely uh, on it to identify the time of the data. So this is the connection between the data and the time in this system. And the next important metric is watermark. And watermark is the oldest event that wasn't processed by stage. And basically it says you the time before what all the work was done. And each stage has input low watermarks that says you 
what before what time all the date all the work has been sent to this stage and there is an output low order mark that says what the data before what time the data uh, were processed by this stage and because most of the stages are uh, ended up with some kind of aggregation you won't see any output uh, until the aggregation window is closed so it's really important because watermark controls the stage output and also it control, controls the output just in general and uh, finally we have a data freshness and data freshness is the number of seconds in the most recent watermark so basically it says how late is your data uh like uh how old uh, the results you see and we saw the spikes in data freshness in the beginning so another important metrics to consider is system latency and each definition sounds like this metric indicate indicate how long can elements wait inside any one source in the pipeline and for me, it was a bit confusing because by sources, they mean storage between the stages. So what it means uh, that if you have some kind of uh, faster stage and the LMS was processed and they, and they wait to be picked up by the next stage. And sometimes they call it also system watermark. So most probably you will see during the profiling, again, you can have some kind of uh, long API calls or uh, some intense computation. And basically it gives you the sense about uh, the, how well performs your uh, pipeline, but not in a context of uh, events of the data, but in a context of uh, relation stages to stages. And it also gives you the sense if you see, like, if you use them in a bundle with data freshness, and it's really useful. So you can see if your data is getting late and if it's happening because of the slowness of your system. And if it's true, you will see some kind of correlation between those spikes. Uh, but there are some. Uh, some cases where you can see the spikes in data freshness without spikes in system latency. Uh, the most common use case, like case for this, is like some kind of aggregation. Uh, you won't see any results before aggregation window was closed, but your like your system performs just fine, and there is no any delays. Uh, but we had uh, the spikes in data freshness without spikes in system latency, and there were no legit reason for it. And I would say this is a kind of red flag that something bad is happening in your system. Uh, both of those metrics are divided to stages, and it's really helpful. You can see if your data is getting late from some particular stage, and it really narrows down the search of the issue. Uh, I wanted to make a little note here that I'm talking about the late data, not in the context that we closed an aggregation window and suddenly some element appeared. By the default, uh, this, those elements are discarded and in the same way configured our system. Uh, I'm talking about late data uh, when we know that there is, that there is uh, some uh, events related to this aggregation window and we can't really close it. And what we can see here uh, that our data is getting laced from the very first stage and actually it aligns with the previous finding that we don't have any issues in our pipeline itself so uh if we don't have an uh, an issue in our pipeline it means it's somewhere in front we have a pop sub in front and we have a publisher in front uh, our publisher is the server written by us so we decided to look into this 
And here, uh, I wanted to uh, get back for a second to the event time. Uh, event time has to be derived from the field in the event. For example, some timestamp field like moment of occurrence or something. And if we have a server uh, and the event time uh, from the message itself, it is possible that it's already late when it got to the server. Or, for instance, if we set it on the server side, uh, there might be some cases where some time has passed before you set it up the time and you posted it to the, um, to the pops up. For instance, you may have some errors and some custom retry logic. So what you, can you do about it? Uh, you can go to your data flow and check that the, there is a special method that indicates an attribute that are used uh, uh, to define the event time. And you can see on the slide the example of it. And after you identify the attribute that are used as an event time, you can go to your client and check uh, where, where this attribute it came from and if it's possible that your um, time is like, um, that you have significant difference between this attribute and the time of publishing. It might be useful uh, to create some metrics that uh, will uh, do some alert if you have significant difference between this even this event time and the time of publishing and we basically we didn't see any uh, errors on our server and we didn't configure this uh, event time attribute and if it's not configured it uses the publish time uh, so basically it means that your event time is equalized to the publishing time, so the moment when it appeared and it pops up. So in this way, we excluded late data from the publisher side. So if it's not in our pipeline and if it's not in our publisher, it means we need to take a look and it pops up. And we uh, like uh, checked a bunch of metrics. The first two is oldest unacknowledged message, and basically it's self-explainable. And another is number of undelivered messages, and it basically the backlog size. And it's also useful to check them together. Uh, because it can give you a sense whether some particular message stuck or you have your backlog uh, built upon your messages uh, messages aging uh, like your pipeline couldn't keep up with the rate of incoming messages. Uh, in our case, we had a significant pops up like we couldn't keep up with it. The only thing we know uh, that we uh, have enough of computing resource to manage uh, this um, incoming rate. So the next two and the most useful metrics we used is sent message count and pull message operation count. Don't mix it with a request number because messages are sent with the batch. And uh, this matrix really helps uh, to see what's going on. So as we can see here, when our show kicks in, our incoming rate increased. And at some moment, uh, the messages are stuck. And after 15 minutes, backlog are processed and the message is like compensated. And if you think for a moment about it, it is really appealing to think about data flow scaling because it looks like we have an increase during the incoming messages and at some point it is stopped and uh, we redistribute the messages and after we compensate our backlog with increased capacity. The only thing we know that we disable all the scaling. But uh, data flow isn't the only thing that can scale here. Uh, we know that pops up scales as well behind the scene. And unfortunately, we don't have a way 
to uh, see what's going on inside of the pop up infrastructure. Uh, but what we can do uh, about it, we can try to reproduce it uh, using those metrics to see what's going on actually. So we decided to do a performance testing and we did a couple of approaches and the first one was simple we created a simple deck just to check if pops up uh, can manage this load and we created a deck that reads from the pops up do some time window aggregation with the same time window uh, do some dummy steps and write back to the pops up and immediately we got an increase in data freshness and we were so excited before we realized that it was because the issue that prevented us from writing to the pop sub with the same rate. Uh, so we updated our dummy step to release only part of these messages. So don't get in this trap, don't spend time on it. Mm, and yeah, after this, mm, like we also did a higher incoming rate than we have in the prod. And also our increase was like uh, instantaneous. So, and, and as you can see, our mm, pipeline performed just ideally. So uh, somewhere in the back of our mind, we still mm, had a doubt that it might be some subtle uh, detail of data flow that we couldn't comprehend. So we decided to do performance testing with the real DAG. And the real challenge here is to create a, a client that can generate messages uh, according to their prod uh, distribution because we wanted to have a representative result. Uh, so quick reminder here, we have a heartbeat events that aggregated to sessions. So uh, we uh, knew that we, we would need to keep a number of simultaneous sessions in the client, so and we know the rate of heartbeat events. So we just divided the uh, general incoming rate to the heartbeat rate, and we had a number of sessions that were dependent from the incoming rate, and we also enhanced the client and uh, not to start and stop all the sessions together, uh, despite all the effort, we couldn't really reproduce the issues. And yeah, and here where the mystery kicks in. Uh, if we were smart enough to do this observation uh, from the very beginning, we could skip most of our investigation, I would say. What you can see here is all this unacknowledged message on the uh, different subscription, from the one topic and subscriptions has different subscribers behind it. They have like smaller uh, data flow cluster, bigger data flow cluster. Some of them have a virtual machines group. So we didn't consider as possible that something might have gone wrong with all of them. So what we can see, the messages were delivered to subscription uh, but they weren't consumed. And we know that uh, there is enough of computing resources to manage this, um, uh, this scale. So we can't really uh, investigate what's going on here, but uh, what we know, we can interpret it. Uh, like we know that something goes wrong uh, with subscription and with multiple subscription and all of this related to the same topic. Uh, I realized while I was preparing this presentation that the only thing I missed during the performance testing is to create uh, a bigger number of subscription, but this is something that can be done in future. So what can you do when you're stuck in the dead end? We realized that we need to ask for Google support. Unfortunately, we didn't have it that time. And so until the moment we got it, our prime time was over. And the next time uh, when it was on, 
they gave some basic tips and before we got to the point it was over again so you need to keep in mind that if you wanted to use a google support it will take time and you need to have a reproducible case and in the last time we didn't have this issue in general so the mystery still persists and we will look into it if it will appear again and at the radical choice we thought if the issue persists we consider to change our messaging system to the Kafka where you have more control over the cluster. Uh, but of course, it's like, you know, quite radical because it will require a lot of effort. Uh, but I'm glad that I were able to collect those findings in some kind of a roadmap. And if it saves some minutes for those who encountered the similar issue, I would be really glad. If you know that I might have missed something or you have some questions, do not hesitate. Reach me out. I would really appreciate it. And if you have any questions, uh, we can go on with them. Yes, thank you, Sergey. Uh, guys, if you have uh, some questions, please unmute and ask. So I understood you use Java for the um... API uh, for the Apache Beam API, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, cool. use Java. Uh, okay, so it's uh, explains the mystery. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, what about consumers? So it was like uh, uh, another services or it was just uh, uh, to some of the databases? Uh, can you repeat the question again? I yeah, yeah. Hear. The question, the question was about consumers. So, what is a consumer? So, it is like some storage in, in the end, or it is like external services, mm. uh, or internal services. It is like Java application as well, microservices, or who is a consumer? Mm -hmm. uh, so, behind the pop we have we have a data flow uh, pipeline that collected the data and. Uh, from my memory, it writes back to the uh, to the pop up. Yeah, it writes back to the pop up. So we we had a, like a bunch of different pipelines uh, across uh, those multiple subscriptions, and all of their uh, all of them were like with a different configuration. Uh, some of them was like um, a virtual machines group, and some of them was like really simple, just uh, straight, you know. Uh, read from the pops up and write to the big query. So, yeah, it doesn't seem that it is related uh, uh, to the what uh, behind the pops up. Uh, but yeah, you know, because mm -hmm. there's a mystery, I I couldn't say for sure. Okay, got it. Thank you. In general, very very interesting, you know, task to to investigate all these uh, okay. steps and deep in dive deeper into that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, yours. Any other questions? Yeah, just a small one. I, I've just somehow missed the, the the resolution of that. So you created a couple topics with a different, I mean, per type of the consumer with the lower number of the subscriptions, or what was the decision in the end? Uh, basically, in the end, uh, we couldn't find uh, what was happening because, like. Uh, we uh, we saw this issue on only during the prime time and the last time we had it uh, we didn't saw this issue so we like couldn't reproduce it so that's why like google support couldn't it couldn't help us so it just disappeared uh so oh. yeah but we, we keep an eye on this and if it will appear again or we will try to to see what's going on but we just like we uh, isolated the part where it's happening. So we saw that it's happening most probably somewhere inside this connection between the topic and subscriptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you pretty much scoped down the problem that's just too many type of the consumers for, for each subscription. And what, what I mean, what would you do in, in the future of that would replicate? Uh, you you have some ideas, of course. Yeah, like uh, we, we thought maybe maybe it's a good idea to use Kafka for this because you have more control. <laughs> so yeah, but like uh, you know, like uh, because of 
uh, of this uh, like uh, multiple subscribers, it's really appealing to think about it like it's uh, like it's happening in uh, scaling of the pops up. Uh, but we couldn't reproduce it uh, during the performance testing. So, uh, so this is the weird thing. So that's why, yeah, it's it's really like it's really interesting. And I actually I really hope that we will see it again, so we could you know dig it a bit uh, bigger. Okay. Thank you for answer. Thank you. Any questions?